This week, a trio of interviews. Alice Slater of Nuclear Age Peace Foundation tells us about her experiences at the United Nations Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, winding up this week in New York after a month of meetings. Dave Kraft of NEIS in Chicago fills us in on Exelon's push to get a $1.2 billion bailout from the bankrupt state of Illinois for five financially unsustainable reactors. And Jules Cook of UCY.TV tells us about an exciting new video database on mainstream media coverage of Fukushima starting on March 11 of 2011. That's right, going back to the earliest reports. Those interviews, plus our ever-popular Numbnuts of the Week, activist shout-outs, the Daily Show Twitter campaign, and more nuclear information than is wise to bring up at a family dinner. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, May 19, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. The big Happy Dance news this week is that 85-year-old sister Megan Rice, 66-year-old Michael Wally, and 59-year-old Greg Vortia Obed have been released from prison. Ta-da! They were ordered released after the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati last week overturned the 2013 sabotage convictions of the three for their peaceful, though deeply embarrassing to the United States government, protest of nuclear weapons at the Y-12 facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. They still will need to be resentenced on their remaining conviction for injuring government property. Ow, ow, the wall said as they hit it with hammers. But it is believed by all rational people that they will be released with time served, which is over two years for all three of them. Nuclear Hot Seat is working on a special about this case, which we hope to have up for you next week. In Oregon, anti-nuclear groups want federal regulators to keep the region's sole nuclear power plant shut down until repairs are made to a cracked pipe that feeds cooling water to the reactor. Ha! The nerve of some activists. The Columbia Generating Station in Richland, Washington, shut down a week ago for scheduled maintenance after the plant had completed a record 683-day uninterrupted run. No cheering allowed. This is not the kind of record you want at a nuclear facility. Energy Northwest, the utility consortium that runs the reactor, contends that the cracked pipe is a minor repair that doesn't need to be done immediately. But it joins a list of growing concerns that activists have raised about the facility, which they claim is uneconomical, outdated, and isn't designed to withstand the size of earthquakes that are possible at the site. Physicians for Social Responsibility on Wednesday, May 13, petitioned the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to suspend the plant restart until the pipe had been repaired. But the NRC on Tuesday gave Energy Northwest another two years to analyze how the expected ground movements would impact structures at the plant. NRC, protecting people and the environment. Not. Alice Slater has worked for nuclear disarmament for decades through the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Alice has been attending the United Nations Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference and had this to share with Nuclear Hot Seat listeners. Alice Slater, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. I'm delighted to be here. For the past three weeks, you have been attending the United Nations Conference Review on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Since we've had it, there's been quite some proliferation going on. It was signed in 1970, and there were uh, five nuclear weapon states at the time, the U.S., Russia, England, China, and France. They promised to give up their nuclear weapons, and all the other countries of the world promised not to get nuclear weapons. Everybody signed except for India, Pakistan, and Israel. And they got nuclear weapons. They went ahead and got them. And also, to sweeten the pot and make people want to sign, they promised them this Faustian bargain 
an inalienable right to so-called peaceful nuclear weapons. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? Peaceful nuclear weapons? To be, I, I should say peaceful nuclear technology. They don't say weapons. I'm saying weapons because every nuclear reactor is a potential bomb factory. That's how countries get their nuclear weapons, by building nuclear reactors and making the materials. And as a matter of fact, North Korea signed the treaty, promised not to get nuclear weapons, got the nuclear technology, walked out and made their own nuclear weapons. And we're questioning what Iran was doing with its technology. So it's a dreadful treaty. It was signed in 1970. It was supposed to expire in 25 years. So in 1995, they came back to the UN to see how they were doing. And at this point, instead of those five nuclear weapon states giving up their nuclear weapons, they had doubled the amount that they had. And a lot of uh, civil society showed up at that uh, 1995 uh, renewal conference. And we lobbied for more promises for disarmament before they would renew it. But there was a lot of pressure put on countries to renew the conference indefinitely, unconditionally, and they renewed it. And the only promises they gave were that they would have five-year reviews to make sure they were keeping up with their promises. And they also promised in order to get the Arab states to agree that they would hold a conference on a Middle East uh, weapons of mass destruction free zone. I mean, Israel is the only country right now in the Middle East that has nuclear weapons, although they never admit it. And, of course, they don't belong to the treaty. So this is what happened. They came back every five years, and they adopted more promises, an unequivocal commitment to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. That was in 2000. And then they promised 64 practical steps in 2010, and instead of making good on their promises, the U.S. has just announced that they're going to spend $1 trillion over the next 30 years for two new bomb factories, one they've already built in Kansas City and in Oak Ridge, and for new airplanes, missiles, and submarines, and new nuclear weapons. And this is after they gave all these promises, so there's totally a lack of good faith. So this year, again, is one of the review years, and for three weeks now, you have been attending sessions at the United Nations. Give us a sense of what has been going on there. Well, I have to back up a little, because two years ago, during the interim period, the International Red Cross, issued this incredible call saying that the humanitarian consequences of nuclear war were so awful and that there was no way that the Red Cross could provide help if such a thing were to occur. After that, Norway held a meeting where 120 some odd countries showed up and civil society and it was the first time we were like all in one room together and they issued a cry saying this is a terrible phenomenon, we cannot have nuclear weapons, and ICANN was born, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, asking for a treaty to ban the bomb, just the way we banned chemical and biological weapons, and to start without the nuclear weapon states, because everybody has a responsibility to get rid of nuclear weapons, not just the ones that have the bombs. And this was very unique because the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, says that the states with nuclear weapons are going to make good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons, but it doesn't say they're illegal, they're prohibited, they're banned, and they've been getting away with literally murder for years. Well, certainly the threat of mass murder. Right. So anyway, we were in Mexico in the summer of 2014 after the Oslo conference. This was a follow-up, which had occurred in 2013. And in Mexico, the Mexican government issued a statement after this conference saying there's no turning back. We're coming into the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is this year, and we must work for uh, nuclear disarmament. 
Well, the next meeting happened the same year in December of 2014 in Austria. And now 150 or 60 states showed up. And for the first time, the U.S. and England came to the conference. They boycotted it, the first, the one in Norway and uh, Mexico. They said that wasn't appropriate and they weren't going to come and it would be a distraction from the promises they had made, but they actually showed up at this conference. And at the end of the Austrian conference, this December, the Austrian government made a pledge that we're going to fill the legal gap for nuclear disarmament, which was their code way of saying we're going to work for the ban treaty because they didn't want to totally aggravate the nuclear weapon states who can't ban this discussion. You know, they keep saying we have to go step by step and block by block and building blocks and they're just stalling and as they're stalling, they're modernizing and building new bombs, so it's totally hypocritical. To the Austrian pledge in December, we are now at this four week non proliferation treaty review conference and it's quite different from all the others because the non-nuclear weapon states are being very forceful, and 91 of them have already signed the Austrian pledge to fill the legal gap. That is the language they are using to move ahead on a ban treaty. And what we expect is that after the 70th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th and 9th, it's 70 years since we dropped the bomb, that we will go to a new meeting possibly hosted by South Africa, and at that meeting we will actually begin negotiations to ban the bomb, just like they did with landmines. You know, they went up to Canada, they called it an Ottawa process, it was outside of the UN, and they just went and they did it. And we think that would be very powerful, not so much with the US and Russia, you know, the nuclear weapon states, but there's a whole group of what we're calling weasel states. They're part of the nuclear alliance. They're under the nuclear umbrella, including Japan and uh, Australia and the NATO countries that have in their documents that they rely on U.S. nuclear power for their defense, bombs for their defense. So we think once we get this thing negotiated, particularly like in Japan, that the people are really going to push their governments to give up the nuclear umbrella, that if we can use it as a cudgel to weaken the nuclear alliance that the U.S. has with the NATO countries. And I'm very excited. I think this is the most promising thing I've seen. I mean, you know, at one point, we thought when we got the nuclear test ban treaty, that's great. This is the beginning of the end. But at that point, Clinton was giving the laboratories like $7 billion a year to do subcritical tests. They were blowing up plutonium in Nevada to do a laboratory development of new weapons. Nothing has stopped. The machine keeps going on, all our victories. But I think this ban will make a big difference. If listeners would want to get involved in this extremely important movement or learn more, where can they go to learn more and what are some steps that they can take? Everybody should go to the ICANN website, www.icannw.org, and they list the 91 countries that have signed the Austrian pledge. If your country's not on the list, write to your president or, you know, sign the ICANN website and get engaged. They're collecting countries all over the world. Like all of Latin America, they have this group, CLAB, Caribbean and Latin American uh, Committee with like 36 countries. They all sign the Austrian Pledge as a group. There are countries in Africa, many in the Middle East are signing it. Afghanistan signed the pledge. Mm -hmm. But, of course, none of the nuclear weapon states are signing it or their allies that we're calling the weasel states. If you're living, does your program go internationally, Libby? Yes, it's, it's a podcast, so it's online. And I literally have people on six continents who listen to this show every week. Well, then we need all of you. Check out ICANW.org, I-C-A-N-W.org and look and see, Google the pledge, the Austrian pledge, and you can see if your country's on that list. 
and sign up for ICANN and get engaged because even now we have another week to go. We have 91 countries. I've been lobbying at the UN. We've been going to missions and getting countries to sign the pledge. There are countries that still haven't signed that should sign, and we're asking people in their capital to write to their presidents or their foreign ministers or, and ask them to sign the pledge. It would be great coming out of uh, the NPT, which ends next Friday, if we could say we have 100 countries. We have 91. Like when we came in, there were 70. So there's great work going on by the um, civil society there. There's a lot of good camaraderie and sticking together and working on a campaign. And I'm, I have not been so encouraged in years. I just feel so good about this. You know, it's funny, as you're talking about them taking the pledge, it reminded me of, I think it was during Prohibition, that people would take the sobriety pledge. <laughs> well, this is sobriety about nuclear weapons. They take the pledge to fill the legal gap so we can finally say they're banned, they're taboo, they're prohibited, and we can use that legal document to influence other countries, to influence the nuclear weapon states that are less amenable, you know, to this. So I think it'll be very good. Fabulous. That was Alice Slater of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Last week, I reported that radiation from the forest fire around Chernobyl had made its way to the west coast of the United States. Then a listener who was concerned about radiation air reports for California and San Bernardino's spike on, on May 9th contacted Michael Collins of Enviro Reporter. Now, Michael, who is highly respected, wrote that the forest fire adjacent Chernobyl made aloft radiation, but not enough of it to disperse over the west coast of the USA. Having read this, I was going to do a retraction this week, but then checked with Mimi Gurman of Radcast and No Nukes Northwest, and she said that there was a spike in radiation from the Chernobyl forest fires that was caught in Oregon, and she's looking into that further. So no retraction at this time, but still a lot of curiosity. In Japan... An enormous spike in neurological diseases have been found since Fukushima. In the evacuation area, more than four and a half times the number of patients went in for treatment compared with the number before the disaster. New patients reported vertigo, Meniere's disease, and acute low-tone hearing loss, with numbers of patients more than seven times what they were before the Fukushima disaster began. Also increasing were the number of reported cases of heart disease and brain infarction, as well as diabetes, osteoporosis, and psychiatric illnesses. There is great concern that there will be additional health hazards, with no end in sight. Particularly disturbing is that 16 more young people who lived near the Fukushima nuclear power plant have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Fukushima Prefecture has been conducting thyroid tests on about 385,000 residents and others who were 18 years old or younger at the time of the onset of the March 2011 nuclear disaster. These new cases were detected between January and March and bring the total number of young people diagnosed with the disease in the testing program to 103. But, of course, in making this announcement, prefectural authorities bothered to state that these cases of thyroid cancer in young people were unlikely a direct result of the nuclear accident. To which Nuclear Hot Seat says, bovine feces. To give anyone still thinking of attending the 2020 radioactive uh, Tokyo Olympics, know that according to fukuleaks.org, testing conducted in February and March of 2015 found cesium in many tap water samples collected from around Japan. Tokyo had higher tap water contamination levels than Fukushima City. Radioactive material was found in a newly built condominium in Nihonmatsu, Fukushima Prefecture. The crushed stone that was used as raw material to make mixed concrete is suspected of being responsible. More of the gravel has already been used in farms and golf courses in the prefecture. 
No word if eco-cement, made with ashes from the incineration of the decontamination debris, was also used in making the concrete in that condominium. And in the town of Namie, near the radioactive wreckage of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, they're planting rice, and they're planning on selling it. This in an area that is still designated as an evacuation zone, and all residents of Namie have been in evacuation since March 11 of 2011. Last year, rice that was not for shipment was grown in the same patties and deemed permissible for human consumption. So the rice was cooked and served at cafeterias in government buildings in Tokyo. Epidemiological study, anyone? And if that's not crazy enough for you... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, num nuts out a week. It's a compound num nuts this week because I couldn't make up my mind. Reuters had a report last week that was headlined, Handling Radioactive Waste at Fukushima Plant Could Be Improved. Ya think? But then they added that this was according to a U.N. agency. And what do they call a U.N. agency? The International Atomic Energy Agency, which it labeled a United Nations nuclear watchdog. No, it's a United Nations nuclear industry guard dog, because that's what it's there to do, to guard the nuclear industry. And what, pray tell, is the vast improvement that the IAEA is suggesting for Tokyo Electric Power Company? That they should consider discharging radioactive water contaminated by the Fukushima Daiichi reactor meltdowns directly into the Pacific Ocean intentionally. These nuclear brainiacs from the IAEA believe it is necessary to find a sustainable Solution to the problems of managing contaminated water. And that includes dumping the stuff directly into the Pacific beyond what's already leaking in and has been leaking for more than four years. And yet Japan is outraged, outraged over the continuing ban on Japanese seafood exercised by China, North Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and New Zealand. Previous releases of Fukushima contamination into the Pacific have drawn protests by Japanese fishermen, environmental groups, and even the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute has declared that contamination from Fukushima has been measured off the western coasts of the United States and Canada. And it ain't going away any human span of existence soon. But wait, there's more. Remember the rice being grown in the evacuation zone near Namie? Well, it turns out TEPCO is going to remove the cover from the destroyed Fukushima reactor, a cover that was never meant to and certainly did not contain the radiation. It was merely put up to prevent the radioactive dust from spreading all over the surrounding country. And they're taking it off exactly when the rice is being planted in the evacuation zone. I'm telling you, TEPCO and the IAEA, with a side order of Reuters, are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out a week. As for those people who have been evacuated from their homes in Namie and elsewhere in the evacuation zone since March of 2011, The Fukushima prefectural government is going to stop providing free accommodations for them as of March of 2017. In Canada, an open letter to the government of Ontario urged the government to direct Ontario Power Generation to withdraw their nuclear waste burial proposal. The letter went to the Premier of Ontario and every member of the provincial parliament, with 100 public interest groups signing on. You can read a copy of the full document at nuclearwastewatch.net. In the U.K., the government is funding a new early warning system to stop swarms of terrorists from shutting down Britain's nuclear power plants. ISIS? No. Jellyfish. 
Jellyfish swarms, technically known as blooms, can block filters on pipes which suck water out of the sea to cool reactors, potentially forcing the whole plant to shut down. Jellyfish have already forced closures at Scotland's Torness power plant. Energy companies lose about one million pounds each day a plant is closed. That's their profit margin, so they're just not making their profit. And still, they're going to seek to recoup their losses from consumers. Ukraine is proposing to reduce the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which is currently at 18 and a half miles, in order to create a zone of reserve in which economic activity and installation of residents will be allowed. No streetlights required because everyone and everything will glow in the dark. We'll have two more interviews in just a moment, but first, interested in a good ebook? Yes, I glow in the dark. One mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond is the story of how one woman grew up to produce a weekly podcast on nuclear issues. Yeah, it's my story, and I'm sticking to it because I'm stuck with it. I think you'll enjoy the read. It's available on Amazon Kindle, and you can play it on any digital device. Give a read. Give it a five-star rating on Amazon, and let me know what you think. Dave Kraft is Director of Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, which is based in Chicago. When I learned that Exelon in Illinois was trying to strong arm and blackmail the bankrupt state into an enormous nuclear bailout, I knew that Dave was the person to sort it out for all of us. Dave Kraft, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Good to be here. Give us a quick update on what's going on in nuclear Illinois in your battle with Exelon. For the last year or so now, within Illinois, we have seen Exxon Corporation manipulating the legislature in an attempt to have the legislature grant it $1.6 billion in bailout money for five reactors here in Illinois that Exxon claims are losing money. And they're going about this uh, in a variety of ways. Before I go too far and too deep into the Illinois situation, I, I will point this out to your listeners and, as I have done to our legislators, that what we're seeing here in Illinois is really just our version here in Illinois of a national campaign that's been going on for the last two to three years where the nuclear industry overall is out to gut renewable energy and energy efficiency everywhere. We've seen that with ALEC, you know, going after renewable portfolio standards and some states already rescinding theirs. What we have here in Illinois is merely the Exelon version of what's going on. Now, Exelon has been a large player in this national movement. They created a front group called Nuclear Matters last year, which has taken out full-page ads in the New York Times and many, many local Illinois papers touting the benefits of nuclear talking about the horror stories of what's going to happen to Illinois if they have to close these five reactors, these five money-losing reactors, and why it really is beneficial for Illinois ratepayers to pay about $300 million a year more in rates to keep those money losers going. So last year, Exelon persuaded our House Speaker, Michael Madigan, to not fix our state renewable portfolio standard law, which had been disrupted by the aggregation movement. There was a glitch in the law which prevented the money from being released to actually build renewable projects. And the parties had reached a tentative agreement on how to fix it when Exelon came in and spoke to Speaker Madigan, after which Speaker Madigan declared, we're not gonna work on the RPS in 2014, Instead, we're going to conduct a state study done by four state agencies, which would determine the negative effects on Illinois if these five reactors close. In other words, the purpose is to find the negatives if the nukes would close, as opposed to coming from a neutral position and just finding out what the position was? Absolutely. It was a study to show, not a study to know. And we pointed that out repeatedly, both to legislators and to the agencies which ultimately conducted the, the study, uh, which came out in January of 2015, we criticized the whole process. Uh, it was a ridiculous process last year. And as you said, they had a predetermined outcome that they were supposed to look at, 
they were probably told what they shouldn't be looking at and what they wouldn't reveal, we pointed out. <laughs> One of the things they didn't look at is what would the negative effects on the Illinois economy be if in bailing out five unprofitable reactors, Exelon destroys the renewable energy and energy efficiency industries in our state, which actually account for about four and a half to five times more jobs than all of the nuclear reactors put together. And we have 11 reactors here operating in Illinois, plus three that are closed. So it was a real sham that went on last year. This year, the environmental community, the business community, uh, institutions, uh, faith-based groups, introduced some legislation earlier in the year. They beat Exelon out of the blocks called the Illinois Clean Jobs Act, in which they promote the use of renewables and efficiency to attain the carbon standards that we expect the EPA will, will enact in this coming year. Exelon came out with their legislation several weeks after that, calling for what they call a low-carbon portfolio standard. And this legislation suggests that nuclear plants have been undervalued because they've never been paid for the value of not putting carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, but all the other renewable sources get that benefit in a somehow. So their version of, of reality came out about a month after the Clean Jobs Act. So this is the current situation now. There was also a third piece of legislation introduced by an Exelon affiliate, Commonwealth Edison, which also goes after the renewable industry and the efficiency industry and keeps it under large, big-box utility control rather than decentralizing and opening up markets for uh, distributed energy, distributed grids, things like that. So that's the lay of the land legislatively. And what we're seeing here is a lot of manipulative language, a lot of really misleading characterizations going on here. Talk a little bit about the radio and TV ads that Exelon is running in Illinois. I did happen to see the TV ad recently, which uh, really goes back to uh, very effective scare tactics of about two decades ago, where uh, if we didn't have nuclear, we'd be freezing in the dark. Literally, in one of the ads, Exelon has a little old senior citizen lady in her rocking chair sitting in a room with no lights on, wrapped in a blanket. Now, what are you supposed to you know, glean from seeing that sight? <laughs> <Is that, laughs> if we don't get our bailout, your senior citizens are really going to be in trouble. You know, they're going to be freezing again. So, I mean, they're just really going down to the, the primal level on misleading advertising to, to scare the heck out of legislators. It's disinformation that they're putting forth, which is what they seem to excel in. Right. And, you know, uh, the language that's been used, too, it's nothing new, but it was criticized 20 years ago. <laughs> the Nuclear Matters ads of 2014 have language in it like reliable carbon-free and emit zero air pollution, you know, I, language like this, clean, reliable, affordable energy. Now, I bring these words up in particular because in 1998, our organization and 14 others, spearheaded by the Natural Resources Defense Council, lodged a formal complaint with the Better Business Bureau's National Advertising Division against the Nuclear Energy Institute, the trade group for the nuclear industry, about their ads using almost identical language here. And remarkably, the National Advertising Division uh, ruled in our favor. They said, this is misleading. You can't make statements like that without qualifying them. The reality 